Good morning. No, it is still just about morning, I think. Uh, welcome to today's webinar hosted by the National Association for Areas of Outstanding Natural Beauty. I'm Chris Woodley-Stewart. I'm Vice Chair of the National Association. I'm Director of the North Pennines AOMB Partnership. Also been part of the DEFRA AOMB uh, National Park Core Working Group developing the Farming in Protected Landscapes programme, which is the subject of today's event. Um, please be aware that we are recording this session, so if you are in any way uncomfortable with that, now would be the time to step away, but I do hope you'll, you'll stay with us. There'll be presentations over the next hour from DEFRA and Protected Landscape staff and from two farmers uh, from AOMBs and National Parks. You'll be able to ask questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box, which you will see if you hover around at the bottom of your screen. We will hope to get through as many of those as we can in the last part of the webinar in a panel session. So type them into the box and we'll gather them together. Now, I'm very much hoping that uh, our colleague Sarah Hardy has joined us um, from DEFRA, although I can't see her on the screen. She's not here just yet, I'm afraid, Chris. Sarah, well, that's a great start, isn't it? So Sarah is meant, Sarah is, when she arrives, Joint Head of Landscape Access and People at DEFRA. She's worked really hard to make this programme a reality. And uh, she has, in fact, with typical fabulous timing from Sarah, just arrived. I did see her briefly on the screen. Sarah is going to give us a brief um, high level overview of the programme. So, Sarah, if you are with us, if you could turn your camera and your audio on, please, and then switch it off at the end, that would be great. She is just coming in. I think she had to leave and come back again. I did see her, but I will. Uh... I think, Sarah, if you can unmute yourself, it should be yeah. good to go. Great. Thank I'm, you. I'm really sorry, everybody. The technology uh, <laughs> it always create prob it creates problems. So, hello. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. My name's Sarah Hardy, and I'm head of the Landscapes Access and People team within DEFRA. I'm really pleased that we're able to speak to you today about the Farming and Protected Landscape Programme. I'd also like to thank the National Association for AOMBs who have helped facilitate this meeting and give us the platform um, on which we speak to you all today. I'm hoping that some of you are already aware of the Farming and Protected Landscape Programme, but I'm sure there are also other, others of you on the call who are hearing about the programme for the first time today. Uh, and I'd like to start by giving you a bit, a bit of background as to why the programme is running and what we hope it will achieve and how long it will be open, the applications will be open for. I'll then hand over to Will, uh, who's part of the FIPL team in delivering the programme at DEFRA, who will give a little bit more about, a little bit more detail on the programme. And just um, so everyone is aware, FIPL is an acronym for Farming in Protected Landscapes. So we launched the FIPL programme in June and it opened for applications in the start, at the start of July. It's a three year programme and it will run until the end of March 2024. The programme is part of DEFRA's Agricultural Transition Plan and it will help you as farmers and land managers in national parks and AOMBs in England to make improvements to the natural environment, cultural heritage and public access on your land. At DEFRA, we see protected landscapes as really special and unique places that need protecting. The programme is designed to focus on the key challenges facing you and your local communities in protected landscapes, helping you to improve the landscape and to effectively manage the high visitors numbers. The programme looks to deliver under four, three, four key themes, climate, nature, people and place, and Will is planning to say more about this in a bit. The programme has been designed to provide the opportunity for you to work more closely with the protected landscape body you farm within. We know that by supporting those who live and work in our landscape, we can help to protect those exceptional places and support the local communities within them. If you're interested in the programme, you should speak to your local protected landscape body to build your application with them. There are farming engagement leads in each protected landscape there to help you work out what's best for your farm, but also to help you understand what will fit in 
with and support the wider protected landscape with which you farm within. I'm sure that you're wondering how the programme fits in with other DEFRA schemes. And so just to be clear, this is a time limited programme and it will work alongside and not in competition with existing DEFRA schemes. If activities can already be delivered through existing schemes, they should be. You can receive funding from more than one DEFRA scheme. You just cannot receive funding twice for the same activity. Over the longer term, we envisage that the sustainable farming incentive, the local nature recovery scheme and the landscape recovery scheme playing a specific part across these are protected landscapes with farmers who lead in the farming in protected landscape program taking projects sorry farmers with farmers who lead on the farming in protected landscape program projects taking part in one of these schemes together with this program we want to make sure that we are supporting the farmers in our protected landscapes to ensure that our protected landscapes are havens for nature whilst allowing them to be places for the public to enjoy, learn and thrive, also while supporting productive farm businesses within them. I'm now going to hand over to Will, who will take you through what the funding will pay for. Thank you, Sarah. And good afternoon, everyone. It's fantastic to have so many people on this call today. As Sarah explained, I'm the team leader for the Farming Protected Landscape Programme. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes just giving you a bit more detail about the programme and how it works. I'm delighted to say we then have a couple of speakers, Tom Vickers and Jake Hancock, who, as farmers, will also give their perspective of the programme. And I should say that I haven't actually spoken to Tom or Jake before, so I'm hoping that they're going to be kind as well as giving their honest thoughts. I want, to give a re I want to say a quick word first on the design of the programme. We've worked really closely with representatives of the AONBs and national parks, three of those, Chris, Sue and Tom, who are on this call today, to co-design the programme, drawing on their years of experience of working with farmers like you and land managers in their own protected landscapes to create a programme that matched the special qualities and requirements of protected landscapes particularly with their expertise, but also with the support from too many others for me to reel off the names here, I believe that the Farming Protected Landscape Programme is a generally an exciting, fantastic opportunity. So what is it and how does it work? Well, perhaps the easiest place to start is what it's not. This is not another agri-environment scheme. There's no suite of options to pick from. This is about you in discussion with the farm engagement lead from your Protected Landscape team, creating a project. So as Sarah mentioned, there are four themes, climate, nature, people and place. And the programme is designed to support you to carry out projects that support nature recovery, mitigate the impacts of climate change, provide opportunities for people to discover, enjoy and understand the landscape and its cultural heritage and support nature friendly, sustainable farm businesses. You need to show that your application delivers against at least one of these and ideally more than one of these themes. It also needs to support the priorities of your local protected landscape bodies management plan. So how do these high level themes translate to what you want to do on the ground? Well, for the climate theme, we're looking for the projects to result in more carbon being stored, sequestered or both, reduce flood risk, a better understanding you and the public as to what different habitats and land uses can deliver for carbon storage and reduce carbon emissions, a landscape that's more resilient to climate change. For the nature theme, we're looking for projects result in a greater area of wildlife rich habitats, greater connectivity between habitats, better management of existing habitats for biodiversity and increased biodiversity. So your project doesn't need to deliver against all of these points. I should say up to recently that when I've been describing what the programme could deliver, I've had to talk hypothetically. But now that we launched, I'm happy to give you examples of ones that we've already been approved since we opened for applications in July and we're going to be funding. So my first example is a project from North Pennines and involves a river being remeandered to slow the flow and reduce flood risk downstream. The old covered culverted section which provided a crossing point for the farmers renewed and a new bridge is put in place to maintain his access. 
New fencing will help manage this stock and reduce erosion risk around the river. And tree planting will help sequester carbon and enhance biodiversity. And then another example, also from North Pennines, a farmer is putting in new and restoring hedges using native species that were linked to nearby riparian woodlands and existing hedges, and which will also provide extra shelter and a bit of forage for livestock. And I hope these two projects give you a sort of sense of scale and different types, complexities of projects you can undertake. And so finally, to look at the other two themes, people and place. To meet the people outcomes, your project should deliver more opportunities for people to explore, enjoy and understand the landscape more opportunities for diverse audiences to explore and understand the landscape and greater public engagement. And the place outcomes, your project should deliver enhanced or reinforced quality around a character of the landscape, historic structures or features being conserved, enhanced or interpreted more effectively, and an increase in the resilience of nature-friendly sustainable farm businesses, which in turn contributes to more thriving economy. So projects we have provided funding for here include one in the South Downs National Park to support the purchase of a mobile animal handling system for the management of Exmoor ponies to facilitate conservation grazing and to enhance the quality and character of the landscape. And again, in a different projects in the South Downs, we're funding the provision of provincial access and the infrastructure around it. So as I said, the projects can cut across multiple themes and we really do encourage this where possible. We want current, in fact, we want also to encourage innovation. This programme is demand-led, so with the protected landscape bodies, we want to hear your ideas that fit in with these themes and their management plan priorities. And just as final words, it really is great to have Semi on your call today, um, and I really hope you don't miss out on this, so please do get in touch with your protected landscape body um, to find out more. Um, and I'll hand back to Chris, thank you. Thanks very much, Will. Um, so a lot of content in there. So please be thinking about some questions you might want to ask and pop them in the Q&A. So we now have the opportunity to hear from two farmers about how the funding can help build stronger farm businesses and promote nature friendly farming. Firstly, Tom Vickers. I'm really pleased to have Tom as a member of our panel in the North Pennines AOMB. Tom, if you could bring your camera and audio on, uh, please, that would be great. Tom's a hill and upland sheep and suckler beef farmer in Weirdale, and he's implemented lots of nature friendly farming methods on his own family farm, which has been in schemes since the first CSA 30 years ago. He's got a real interest in mitigating climate change, reversing biodiversity decline, as well as helping develop local, sustainable, healthy food networks. With his partner, Tom's also launched a sister business in our area called Northern Native, which is aiming to rear and supply what we might call environmentally sensitive meat, focusing on woodland pork and grass-fed beef and lamb. So, Tom, if you'd like to um, turn on your audio and your camera and, and speak to us for a few minutes, please. Good afternoon. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, yes, my name's Tom Vickers. I'm a hill and upland sheep and suckler beef farmer in Weirdale, County Durham. We're inside the North Pennines AOMB. We're a, a fairly traditionally uh, run hill farm, uh, sort of edging and transitioning towards a more sustainable and restorative system. We run um, pedigree Swaledales native breed and uh, traditionally we've run dairy cross suckler cows, more hedging towards native breeds now with a beef shorthorn. So um, I've been asked to talk to you today just uh, how, how I feel the Farming and Protected Landscape Scheme can benefit us as a business and uh, farmers more generally. And as was mentioned earlier, obviously, this is part of the agricultural transition plan. So my initial thoughts were, where does this fit into the change in policy? And um, obviously, now we've got a we should have a fairly good understanding that um, farming is changing. We're going to see probably more changes in the next 10 years than we have in the last 20 or 30. Now, it's, it's clear with the removal of farm subsidies, uh, we're heading towards a more public money for public goods based system. I, I see farming protective landscapes in this respect being a really useful gateway in farmers in these areas, being able to access funding to help them get projects started on the ground for the implementation and enhancement of public goods on their farm. 
hopefully with a view to when the new stewardship agreements roll around in 2024, being in a really good solid position to provide, uh, to set up good, good well-structured schemes to benefit both them as a business, the local community, nature, climate, uh, biodiversity, and uh, hopefully maintain the, 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 the features of the landscape and the place. Um, I'm probably speaking more generally and more biased towards our RAOMB and the areas similar to it, but these protected landscapes tend to be harder areas to farm. I suspect they're going to be more, uh, they're going to be hit harder by the change in policy and the removal of, um, of, of subsidy in the next seven or eight years. Uh, I think this will be, a, as I said, a good opportunity to try to make that transition as smooth as possible um, with, it, with hopefully being able to, you know, get in a good position with the ELM scheme. Um, I, I expect that, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to think the uptake on this, on, on FIPPLE will be quite, uh, quite good, really, because I think you've got to, I mean, realistically, you're looking at our business specifically we know that we're going to have to make big changes um really now hopefully farmers are starting to look at their businesses and realize that as the years roll on things are going to be more difficult especially in these um protected landscapes and and hopefully they can be, make good contact and have a good relationship with their local aomb um and on the ground get out, have a good look around your farm, see where you might be able to, 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 to implement projects that will hit these four, the four main targets, that the, the climate biodiversity people in place, but also the local area targets as well. So I'm optimistic. I think that this scheme is a good, this project is a good project. I'm looking to take advantage of it myself. And I'm hoping that many other farmers in our AOMB and further afield do as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. That's great. Um, if I could ask you to return to uh, muted and uh, with your camera off, please. That'd be great. And we'll come back to Tom uh, and our other um, colleagues during the Q and A. Well, let's go south now and hear from Jake Hancock. Uh, Jake has run Wessex Grazing uh, for the last fifteen years, a family-run business providing conservation grazing and traditional farm management across nine thousand hectares of Dorset, one of my favourite counties, certainly. Uh, Jake manages and sells native breeds of uh, cattle and sheep, whilst also having a major focus on public engagement and education about farming and food production and the environment. And that includes an active schools programme and on-farm events for a range of audiences. So Jake's all about uh, delivering sustainable farming in tandem with nature conservation and inspiring future generations. He's also spent 10 years being a farm advisor and grew up on farms managed by his dad. So I can't actually think of anybody more qualified to talk to you. Uh, for the next five minutes. Jake. Thank you everyone. I don't know, you've obviously got some background on me that uh, is from someone else, but yes, that's that's a good uh, run through of my career. Um, hello everyone, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, as has just been mentioned, I run a business called Wessex Conservation Grazing. Uh, it was very sort of intentionally named when the, uh, my I started the business when the higher level scheme was set up and when uh, single payment was decoupled in 2006 or just, just after that moment. So I was really, I saw an opportunity to um, get set up as a farmer at that moment um, off the back of those two things um, and try and take on land of high conservation value, thinking that that might be land that would continue to be supported in the longer term, but also was relatively easy for me to get going with low setup costs. And that plan has worked very well. Um, until I suppose recently and now with the, the loss of basic payments on the horizon that has a pretty dramatic effect on my bottom line um, simply because we are very limited on what we could most of the land that we farm is of high environmental value so we don't have opportunities to intensify or diversify in the same way as more conventional farmers might have done um, so certainly I've got concerns about the future and I'm looking to, to ways to increase our uh, income in, from other sources. Um, just a, in terms of the business now, we currently look after six sites. In, these include conventional farms, where, which are actually organic. We're, we've got a sheep flock on a, in an organic farm rotation. 
uh, where we're providing um, the livestock element in rotation with um, our landlord's uh, organic arable system, and that's all on herbal lays. Um, we, most of the rest of our land is basically either county wildlife site or national nature reserve or triple SI. Um, and we're running North Devon cattle and Aberdeen Angus cattle. We've just recently set up a pedigree uh, Aberdeen Angus herd looking to sell pedigree um, black and red Angus bulls as one way of trying to increase our income from the livestock without um, reducing our uh, our sort of eligibility for some of the environmental schemes and land that we're managing. Um, I've put my contact details there if anybody wants to get in touch. Uh, I think somebody's going to kindly click on to the next slide for me. Now, yeah, great, this is working very well. Um, so in terms of the FIPL grant application, I only really picked up on this grant in the last month or two. Um, and it's, it's very recently that we, I sort of got in touch with the Dorset AONB um, and got things going. So we're at the early stages, really. Um, the land in question is called Turnworth Down, which is uh, on the sort of chalk land high in the middle of Dorset, just south of Blandford. Um, it's actually a wood pasture with chalk grassland in between all the glades. And there's also a, a 20 hectare scheduled ancient monument, which is an Iron Age uh, ring and field system. Um, we're in year three of the countryside stewardship scheme. So we've done all of our capital works already, which were mainly to do with pond restoration and tree felling and scrub management. Um, and that's all done. Uh, and in addition to that, we're probably carrying out of the order of one to two thousand pounds a year simply on maintenance to try and stop the scrub encroaching on the wood pasture uh, and i guess thinking about the fact that my bottom line is going to be fairly significantly affected by the loss of basic payments um, really farmers are looking to effectively shed their own costs in that situation as one of the ways of dealing with it so i guess the capital works and the, or the maintenance of the maintenance elements of those schemes are going to come under pressure as farmers feel they've got less money in the pot um, to spend on on maintenance of the land once the capital work schemes are over um, and so i think possibly this is one area where FIPL may pick up um, a fair bit of work in trying to continue to do sort of habitat recreation um, that wouldn't otherwise get done when things are, get tighter in future can i have the next slide please Okay, so we had our first meeting with the Dorset AONB team probably less than two weeks ago. Um, they made very positive noises about some of the ideas that we came up with, uh, including inviting me to take part in this webinar, which makes me think that these ideas will hopefully uh, more or less go through uh, without too many amendments. So these are the um, things that we've come up with. And in fact, um, I think we're going to committee in the next week or so. So our, our application's literally at the point of going in right now. Um, the land in question is, a, I'm a tenant of the National Trust uh, and they had a sort of, would like to do um, woodland plan that they had recently put in place for my own capital work scheme. And that included some work which there was no budget for, but whilst they were doing the plan, they came up with project ideas. So really that's, uh, tree felling, um, protecting or opening up glades, creating, making sure that the, sort of pushing back the, the woodland and the scrub in favour of some of the chalk grass and, uh, and protecting some of the veteran holly and oak and ash trees that get overtopped and shaded out by some of the younger trees that are more vigorous. So there's, there's about five or six thousand pounds worth of work that we've got that we're applying for for that. Um, we also looked at the cattle handling system, which I built in 2006 when I set up, um, when I first started farming here. Uh, so it's now sort of 14, 15 years old with the, with some of the posts starting to fall apart and, and, and it's in need of some serious repair. So we're going to not only repair what we've got there, but also expand it so that it's a bit more practical and useful for both handling and loading cattle on site. Um, the other thing that we do a lot of within our business is education. Um, we already fulfill all of the 25 um, educational visits that we can do under our countryside stewardship scheme. Uh, we're actually looking to get other sites, although we have other sites in high level scheme, we, didn't ha we don't have education on those agreements. So we're currently limited to 25 talks a year. My wife's a teacher and I, and I very much enjoy giving 
uh, those talks to farmers. So uh, we can certainly do a lot more than we do already. And the other thing that we've, uh, we were very disappointed in with the new countryside stewardship scheme was that they've completely stuffed up the scope of the scheme. So where, although the payments have improved under countryside stewardship, we now can only talk to school age children. Once you've left school, uh, there's no funding to deliver um, sort of educational walks and talks, teaching to college or university groups or older interest groups, including groups of farmers. We can't do that funded anymore. So really we'd like to broaden out the scope if we can using the FIPPLE grant, again, to how it used to be, where we could talk to groups of any age. Um, the other thing they've stopped us doing was giving talks off the site in question. So we used to be able to go into schools, we did a lot of that, uh, or give a talk on any of the other sites that we managed, which weren't in the scheme that we were, had the educational option on. So that, again, is a, a real lost opportunity we felt within the Countryside Stewardship Scheme. So. We're hoping that in our application that, that, that it will be accepted that we can re, we can broaden out the scope of where and who we're giving talks to. Um, so that we'll, we'll see where we get to with that. Um, anybody who's been watching um, file, what's it called Country File recently may have noticed that down on Studland Beach in Dorset, there's some, a no fence collar project um, where I, that's actually cattle I look after for the National Trust where we're grazing the dunes on Studland Beach. Now those collars have been fantastically useful, not only uh, in, in helping us to manage that habitat without putting up lots of fences, um, but also a lot of the sites that I keep cattle on have got a, 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 are at least half, if not more woodland, and they may be sort of two, three, 400 hectare sites. Um, and Turnworth, where we're putting in the FIPPLE application, uh, it's wood pasture and at least half of it is woodland. So. You can easily go up there and not find the cattle in the morning looking for them on a hot day like today. Um, so the collars we have been using are fairly unreliable with a shortish battery life, but these no fence collars, because they're solar powered, have been much, much more reliable. So we're hoping we can possibly get some no fence collars um, into the agreement. Um, and then, um, so that's really it in terms of the, the grant scheme that we want to put in for this season, which obviously runs out in March, total cost of what we're putting in is about 14 and a half thousand. Uh, and that we're hoping to get maybe 13,000 from the grant application um, to help with that. Uh, and we are looking ahead to next year's round. And some of the things in our mind are improvements to the water supply, which is quite unreliable. I saw in some of the literature from the Dorset AONB that trainee ships are certainly on the cards. And that's something we would be really interested to do. Uh, also, we're involved in some regenerative agricultural projects, as I mentioned earlier, with um, herbal lays on an organic farm rotation. So that's something I'd be interested in. And lastly, because of our educational um, work that we do, we were thinking about whether we could do a proper historic landscape survey, which has never really been done, even though we've got a really quite impressive archaeological site at Turnworth. Uh, and it, I think we may be able to look at doing some work there in order, to, in order to better understand the historic landscape and include that within our educational work. So we're quite excited if we can get some or all of those things um, included going forward. So that is in a nutshell what we're looking at and uh, hopefully that's of interest to some of the rest of you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jay. That's a really nice example of uh, a diverse application to the programme delivering across lots of the outcomes so thanks that's fantastic so um, I'll just remind everybody that you can put your questions to the panel for today uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll deal with those shortly I'd now like to introduce two other members of the FIPPLE core working group if they could put their cameras and uh, audio on that's Tom Munro Dorset OMB manager and Sue Fletcher head of landscape at the Peak District National Park Authority uh, they're going to highlight how you can get some more information about the programme and how you can make an application. And Tom, I think we're starting with you. Thank you very much, Chris. Can everyone hear me OK? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'll just give you a bit of a bit further information about where you can find out more information. Um, the best place to start really is the uh, DEFRA or your protected local pr protected landscapes website. Um, on there, there's some, some well-developed applicant guidance um, that talks you through uh, some of the various types of projects or activities that could be funded under each theme and the application form and how to go through it and the, the necessary documentation required for that. 
Um, the, their, your local protected landscape, so work out who it is you want to talk to first. If you have land that spans uh, two protected landscape boundaries, it doesn't matter which one you go to, um, they'll talk to each other about it. Um, but uh, talk to your local protected landscapes, whether it be the, the AOMB team or the National Park Authority, um, and uh, find out what's going on there. So there, many have produced newsletters, uh, many have developed a, a bit further detail on the scheme. Um, and many are running one-to-one -one workshops or uh, surgeries, um, webinars, further webinars like this with a local flavour, or um, workshops and a presence at agricultural fairs, although the season's coming to an end for that, or uh, livestock markets, for instance. Um, several AOMBs and national parks have also been working with the, the local advisor network, so you may find the advisors you would normally turn to for um, this kind of work are already up to speed on it. Um, bear with us, though, with the, contacting the protected landscapes teams. Uh, this has, you know, it's arrived with us relatively recently, and some are still in the, the uh, midst of recruiting for it or working out how to resource it within their teams. But they, they have the information, they've, um, they've been well trained, and they will be able to help you. Um, and the sorts of help that they can make, can add to the, the guidance that you'll find on the website are uh, around theming projects really that might be able to find opportunities for collaboration. Um, for example, uh, there's a, a growing interest in Dorset in um, deer larders and the, the infrastructure required for landscape scale deer management and that would be a, a collaborative multi-holding uh, type project. Um, and uh, they would be able to um, advise any sort of specific local priorities. It's also worth, uh, if you're a tenant, talking to your landlord about your ideas. Um, applications require landlord consent. Um, and it's worth talking to your neighbours too to see if you can join up and collaborate and um, make a sum that is greater than the, the, a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And from that, I'll hand over to Sue, who will talk to you about uh, making the application. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. Um, so how to make an application. When you've had a look at the information that Tom's just, just run through, and if you think your project might fit, Vipul, whether it's just a glimmer of an idea or a fairly well-developed project, get in touch with your protected landscape team. Get yourself on the inquiries list. Uh, some protected landscapes are also using simple expression of interest for, forms, but not all. We really just encourage you to talk through your ideas with the Protected Landscape team. Make sure it fits with the programme. Check out other opportunities, as Tom said. You know, a call about a pop-up campsite can really quickly lead to something around carbon assessment, concession access, interpretation, lime kiln restoration. And that, that example is based on a real life example. Um, it might be just a phone call. It might be a site visit. There might be the need for, or the opportunity for further discussions. It's really about developing your, your project idea. Um, you need to have a think about, do any of your proposed activities need consent, be it planning permission? Uh, I think Jake mentioned SSI consent, or is your land subject to any inheritance tax exemption management plan conditions? Check the options in terms of any existing agreement agreements that you may have. Can't be any double funding with this. Look around to see if there are any other farmers doing the same or similar. So that might be in terms of is is there is what they're doing already competition to your project, uh, or is it something is a space for your project, or is it something that you can collaborate with? Have you got a unique selling point? In terms of cost, you will need to know if any of your proposed activities are the same as the current countryside steward, stewardship options. If they are, you will need to use the option and payment rate, but again, the Protected Landscape team can help you with that. If not, then you need to ask for three quotes. You will need to be clear which year, years one, two or three, the work will be realistically, com realistically completed and claimed. That'd be really helpful for, in terms of managing the budget for the Protected Landscapes. Funding can be allocated for just one year or across the three years. Or you could put in a phase one application, uh, and in the Peak District we're getting quite a few of these, around survey or feasibility study, which will then inform the detail of your next phase and application. And really it's about getting your application in. Make sure you've got all the details that are, are required, any permissions, quotes. 
And if you're applying for more than the 5,000 grant funding, then it's worth checking when the next local assessment panel date is, and then you can work to that date. And just to end really, FIPL is just such a fantastic opportunity. Uh, and thanks for DEFRA to working hard to keep it as flexible as possible within the framework they've set for us. But it really can be bespoke to the needs of each protected landscapes. Thank you, and I'll hand back to Chris. Thanks very much both. Well, I'd now like to ask all the panel members to turn their cameras uh, on because uh, we turn to the Q&A part of the webinar. I think you've all been putting questions into the uh, Q&A section of the um, platform. Our DEFRA colleague, Alan Padua, has been moderating the questions. So, uh, Alan, if you could read out the first question that you'd like the panel to take and I will, I will find a victim to answer it. Thank you, Chris. Um... And uh, thank you everyone for your presentations. Uh, just to say we've had a number of questions which have been answered already by our panellists uh, and a big thanks to those um, those who have provided questions as well. Some really uh, useful ones coming through. Uh, hopefully some of the presentations that Tom and Sue touched on answer some of the more logistical ones. Uh, so there's one about um, do we qualify if we're on the edge of an AOMB area? So Ali's asking that. Um, and we've said uh, yes, I think you would be obviously taking it on a case-by-case -case basis, but yeah, it would be open for people in those areas. Sue, Tom, please correct me if that's uh, mistaken. Tom, do you want uh, to take that? That's definitely the case. Uh, that is definitely the case, yeah. yeah. So um, land neighbouring a protected landscape is eligible um, mm -hmm. if it is within a holding that crosses the boundary and also if it is contributing to things that benefit the protected landscape, like a, a nature recovery network or a, um, holding water back from a flood prone area or something like that. Um, and a similar question, uh, was there a minimum acreage required to access funding and support? Uh, we said no. I think, that, Tom, that's, I think that's you again. I think that's, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Just to be clear, we're, we're, the scheme doesn't cover domestic property, so there is no minimum acreage, but um, that doesn't come down to someone's garden. That's perfect. Um, so I'm just trying to... Um, just Going through the questions, uh, some questions about the application form and guidance, which Sue has touched on already. Um, what we've, the revenue stream might be able to fund. I think um, I think we've touched upon that already. The any of the projects that we should address any of the four themes of the program. Find one that we haven't. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, let's take a look. Um, so, quick question. Um, if you have more than one project on a farm, can you make multiple applications to deliver more than one of the key themes? So, how do you fancy that? Oh, of course. Thank you, Chris. Um, yes, you can do more than one application. Uh, you can do more than one application in one year uh, or go one in year one, one in year two. I think the thing to say on that, if, if your uh, applications are for less than 5,000 in terms of FIPL funding requested, then that obviously doesn't have to go through the local assessment panel, so it can be turned around more quickly by the Protected Landscape team. However, if you go for a second one, that's okay. If you go for a third under 5,000, that would need to be referred to the full local assessment panel. But, but yes, and I think we're getting quite a few of those inquiries, certainly here in the, in the Peak District, and I know others are as well, where people are putting in a phase one for that, that survey information or that bit of feasibility study in terms of that informs the development of their project idea further. So that, that phase one and phase two is, seems to be really helpful. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sue. Right. And Sue, could you also clarify on the £5,000 threshold that you mentioned? Um, I think this is the limit for the, the projects which is covered in the guidance. Could you add a, a couple of questions just uh, following up after your last last point? Okay, so so if what you're asking for from FIPL is less than 5,000, it can be signed off by a senior protected landscape officer. Uh, I think there were some questions, Alan, which I think is what you're referring to around the minimum and maximum. So uh, technically, uh, under the agreement with DEFRA, there is no minimum. The maximum is 250,000 per project. However, it is up to each protected landscape local assessment panel in discussion to decide whether they do have a minimum amount and also whether they work to that maximum amount. And that obviously relates very much to the total project fund that they've got. So you really need to check that out on your protected landscape website. Thank you. 
Thanks, Tim. That's perfect. Um, a question um, on FIPO funding. Uh, does it get paid directly to the farmer or is it paid through the national park? Uh, this question is from John. Um, this is important as some national parks use this as leverage to make farmers pay for planning permission that has permitted development in other areas. So, um, I won't, uh, I won't see comment on the last part of that, but I think on the first part, that um, um, Will, would you like to take that one? Yep, so on, on the first part, um, the different money gets transferred to the A&Bs and national parks, and uh, the agreement is drawn up uh, with the farmers between them and the payments goes through the national parks and A&Bs to the farmers. So the agreement that everybody has will be with the individual protected landscape rather than agreement with DEFRA. Yeah. Alan? Uh, that's perfect. Uh, just I can see quite a lot of questions coming a in. A number of questions have, have just been uh, uh, coming in. Um, this is, um, will the content of approved schemes be made public in terms of the content to help encourage idea development? So this is a long um, next question in terms of any other uh, generating ideas for projects. A couple of people I'd like to answer that question. First of all, um, how would one of our farmers feel about that? Um, and then I'll ask Tom or Sue if they're actually planning to make theirs public. I think technically they're probably public documents, they're probably, probably public records, but with commercially sensitive material taken out of it. Tom, how do you feel about that? Um, I wouldn't have any concerns. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's public money producing public goods that should all be above board and should be transparent. Thank you very much. And I think, Tom, are you publishing yours in some way, shape or form? We will. We'll have very uh, scant detail as a list on the website, um, but they will be they will be listed and publicly viewable. I think that's the way we'll, we'll certainly approach uh, ours. And Sue? Yeah, just the same uh, as uh, Tom. I think before we did any major case studies, we'll pick some major case studies, but we'd obviously make sure the farmer was happy with that before we did that. And so far, it's been really useful in the webinars we've done with, with farmers, land managers, in terms of just using a map to outline the sort of applications and, and interest inquiries that we've had. And I think that really helps just develop project ideas. So, yeah. Sure. And I think in terms also of... Um, public understanding of what it is that we're doing, we'll be also publishing the names of our panel members on our websites as well. So because uh, I think it's reasonable for farmers and land managers to see who it is that's uh, sitting in judgment of their of their proposals. Alan. Thank you. Um, this next question is about um, some Charlotte on um, monitoring evaluation. Uh, so on monitoring and evaluation. So how are you going to measure outcomes? Will the monitoring be ongoing, including after FIPO has ended? Will, you know I'm going to come to you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, yes, yeah, so we will be having a separate evaluation process, which we're um, just in the process of starting now, um, which we'll be looking at outcomes, um, and it will go through the lifespan of FIPL. We'll look um, shortly after um, FIPL has ended. Um, but we have to accept that some of the actions we've taken won't deliver benefits for some years to come. So. We appreciate that not everything will be captured by the evaluation, but certainly a lot will be. Sue? So? Yeah, just maybe worth adding, adding on that, that obviously the application form includes asking what your outcomes will be, what your project will, will deliver. And so um, when you put your claim in, there'll be a, a discussion with the FIPL officer about ha has it matched what you've done? Uh, but then I think as, as um, so there'll be some level of sort of seeing how that's gone and any learnings from that, but also, as Will said, then there's the national evaluation where it's probably going to be the larger projects that will be fully engaged in, in part of that evaluation. I just thought that was worth sharing. Thank you. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Thanks, Sue. Alan? Uh, there's a couple of questions on um, compatibility with existing schemes. Mm -hmm. Um, so the example, the hedgerow example, North Pennines, um, why wouldn't be funded through something like countryside stewardship, hedgerow and boundary scheme? Um, that's one particular, particular example. And a similar question um, in terms of recommendations for um, getting a capital grant from an existing ELS or HLS scheme to provide drinking tanks rather than apply through 
um, following protected landscapes. Um, I don't know if, if anyone in the, in the team can take those two questions or perhaps speak more broadly about um, compatibility with other schemes. Sure. Um, Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about compatibility with CS? Um, I don't expect you to know about the North Penangs example, but you can probably you can probably guess. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Compatibility. The, so compatibility. Um, the the key thing to remember is that farming and protected landscapes cannot pay for the same activity on the same piece of land at the same time as any other scheme. Um, so you may find within if you are currently within a countryside stewardship scheme, you may find that there are activities that you had wanted to get into that scheme but weren't able to, or you've come to the end of your capital works period and there's a few more things you'd like to continue to do. And they're all things that we could consider for farming and protected landscapes. Um, and in terms of making a choice about uh, whether you ought to be in countryside stewardship or you ought to be um, doing work in farming and protected landscapes, that's, that's really a personal choice. Um, countryside stewardship will give a, a guaranteed longer agreement, farming and protected landscapes agreement close in March 2024. Um, but if there are some, some works within that time that you wish to carry out, then it may be more appropriate to seek FIPL funding. Thanks, Tom. And I think that oh, the North Penang example, and I can't remember the chapter and verse on these particular people, but um, it will have been they're either not in a scheme. And actually, FIPL is a toe in the water for getting involved in delivering public money for public goods, and they may indeed progress to a scheme through this engagement, or they have a scheme already, but that they couldn't modify. Um, I think something that's really important to pick up on, if I may abuse my position as chair for a moment, is that there is every intention to make sure that nobody will be penalised, as it were, for doing things now or to get their farm into a better condition for delivering public goods. You won't somehow be disadvantaged in new schemes. And there's a commitment to make from DEFRA to make sure that that, that, that doesn't happen as far as possible. So waiting for the new scheme isn't necessarily a wise strategy because you could be paid to do something now and either that agreement through FIPL will end in March 2024 or it could be ended mutually to allow you to go into something into a new scheme which might give you a, a greater advantage so don't be you know don't be concerned about taking action now because I think it can only stand you in good stead. Um, Alan. Mm -hmm. um, and again thank you everyone for submitting these questions if we can't get through all of them today um, We'll try and get through as many as many more as we can now. Um, a question for Jake. Uh, thanks for your presentation. A very high proportion of farming on the, on the chalk soils is not sustainable, uh, including the South Downs. The CAP actively encouraged farms to get rid of their animals. We have lost the skills and infrastructure. We need to restore rotation with animals. Do you think that moving animals around from one estate to another can be profitable? That's a, a good question um, for me. Um, as I, my, my holdings are about as spread out as anybody's would be. Um, I'm farming on the Purbex. So I live in Paddletown. If your geography is not very good, I farm on the Purbex, which is half an hour or 40 minutes in one direction. Farm at Blandford, which is uh, another half an hour north of me. Salisbury, which is an hour northeast. And I used to farm at Axminster, which was an hour to the west of me. So I spent a huge amount of time driving between holdings, which is, I guess is the least sustainable part of what I do um, and I think it's very challenging because ultimately I didn't inherit a farm and I have looked to get involved in farming through opportunities as they arose within a traveling distance and of course I've got to in include that travel time and the extra work involved in all of my costs so um, I think it's a real challenge I think for my business losing basic payments is to come straight you know, it's, I don't know what everybody else's situation is but for me it's probably 30,000 pounds off our bottom line which is a huge dent in our profit um, it, and so it's a, we're, we're working out how, what we can do going forwards now clearly some of the places that I'm farming and some of the places and I think a lot of the smaller sites that people will be involved with are going to become unviable you can't you know, they're only some of these places have only become viable because of the introduction of HLS type rates of payment, in addition to being paid for the area payment on basic payments rather than for the number of cattle you've got. So, so there are going to, I'm sure sites are going to become that were viable for some farmers are now going to become unviable. 
Clearly, we're looking to make more money from our livestock. Clearly, we're, we're looking to see what sorts of diversifications might fit with our farms, or in my case, it's all nature reserves. So I can't go building structures that might allow me to earn more money. All of the things that you'd normally see as diversification, for me as a, not quite a one-man band, but almost, it's adding a huge amount of labour in order to try and stand still in terms of income. So I am concerned and I'm looking for where the opportunities lie in future. Um, so it, it's going to be a challenge. But I don't think, you know, in terms of that question, bouncing that back to people at DEFRA and in the AOMBs, yes, all of your sites are going to become significantly less viable by 2027 than they are now unless those farmers find some other magic way of making some money. So anything you can do to support them is going to be helpful. Thanks very much. It's very comprehensive. Um, Alan. Yes. Um, so a couple more uh, eligibility questions. Um, so I'll take them both in turn. Uh, can we apply for, this is from Catherine, can we apply for joint funding for a project as a part of a farmer cluster and funding for a different project as an individual farm in the same year? That's the first question. And Andy's let's just question, take, let's take, let's sorry, take that absolutely, on its absolutely, own. It's yeah. quite a long one. So uh, Sue or Tom, do you want to take that? Yeah, I'll have first go at that one. So the answer to that is, is yes. If you want to do a, a collaborative application, you can do that and you can also do an individual one uh, in the same year. I don't think that would be a, a problem in terms of the collaboration. It's just how you might choose to set it up. So one person will have to take the responsibility really for the uh, application and the subsequent agreement if it's approved and then decide how that is um, split ac across those farmers that are collaborating. Alternative, you could enter into a formal collaborative agreement, but hey ho, nobody's not everybody's at that point. So there are different ways. And again, if that's an issue, just talk it through with the Protected Landscapes team, and we'll be sharing how these sort of issues are, are solved. Uh, so hopefully that'll really work collectively across the Protected Landscapes as well. Thanks. That's great. Alan, uh, next one. Uh, so eligibility see. linked one, perhaps. Thanks, yes. Sue. It was an LGP. Um, oh, it's just been. Ah, uh, yes. So um, this is a question from Andrew. Uh, they've formed a group of commoners and farmers and would like to apply. Uh, what do we need to do to formalise the group to meet the criteria required? Who'd like to take this one? I'm going to attempt to come back to Sue with things like this. She's got such a lot of experience with this kind of thing. There's a really helpful piece of guidance under the countryside stewardship. Uh, I can't remember the link. Maybe we could put the link in the in the chat afterwards, um, or make sure people get it because that sets out about particularly those commoner agreements and what's required for stewardship. And that's what we would start this be the starting point for FIPL. Tom, you might want to add, or Chris. Tom. Uh, yeah, that's right. Also, uh, some some form of partnership agreement, for example, for a for a farm cluster, would be what we're looking for. Um, the the level of formality and the amount of lawyer input you need in that would depend on the the risk that that's exposing you to. But it, it could be a very simple document. Hello. Um, this is a quick question on. Um, and from Peter, how do you see increased public access working alongside trying to increase improving wildlife? Uh, so this um, so Peter has 14 acres of open access land. And if you were to put up a sign telling people to keep their dogs on leads during the ground nesting bird season, it would not last 12 hours. Hey, what I don't want to do is open this up to being a conference about the natural environment more widely. But um, in terms of the question, um, it is perfectly possible to fund um, new access arrangements and access management through FIPL. Um, does anybody want to have uh, make a brief response to that question? It is possible to fund access in this way. I'm, I, I'm sorry that the, the questioner would have a real problem with keeping visitors dogs on leads. I know it's a real challenge in a great many places, um, but it would be possible to fund access infrastructure uh, and access agreements through FIPL. It may not be what you particularly want to do, the questioner in this particular case, but it is something that we can do through FIPL, um, perhaps you know, providing linear access and making sure that dogs were controlled by the fencing associated with linear access might be an option. Could I add to that? You, you can add to that. I just didn't want to open it too widely into a general conference about, uh, about the landscape more widely. 
That, that's thanks, Chris. And uh, I'm not going to take it wide only to say that FIPL could also support some educational materials that would encourage and explain why dogs should be kept on leads or um, why well well behaved um, animals are welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, just we've had a really interesting example recently where, you know, um, a farmer land manager has come up with quite an innovative idea where he's actually thinking of making a rebuilding a, a sort of a, a wall, quite a high wall as is existing, but not in good shape, and actually looking at whether it'll work to provide a specific dog walking area and then possibly exploring training courses because we've got the COVID impact with uh, lots of puppies and young dogs and changes around that. So whether that'll come to anything, I don't know. But as Chris said, FIPL can do access in terms of that situation. You know, it could be about concession routes and as Tom says, more on the positive interpretation to encourage but yeah we we know there are issues with that but people yeah. can help that's part of where it can be quite innovative i think thanks i think that's the important message um for the question there i mean it won't be for everyone in every place but people can help in in many occasions um thanks chris um a couple of more questions to go um sue um sue would answer, i'd like to answer this question live um uh, so Sue mentioned countryside stewardship rates where these are available. Uh, those for leaky wood dams are very prescriptive and have, have been rarely adopted anywhere, I believe. Is there scope to use three quotes for more creative work as an alternative? Do projects under £5,000 require three quotes? Sue, would you like to take that one? Thanks, Alan. Yeah, really good question. Uh, if something you want, if a project you're wanting to do uh, is, is in the CS option list, but it's not the same, then absolutely, this is part of what can make it really bespoke to what's needed in a particular area. So you would need to develop that as a project still. So yes, you can do that. You need to talk it through with your protected landscape team. Uh, if your application is for less than £5,000 of funding, yes, you still need to ask for three quotes. So Will, you might want to add a little bit more here. Yep, I think just to say, I think so. You've covered it really well, but um, just to say, yeah, three three quotes is is necessary um, for all these things to show that we're getting value for money. I think we're looking for people to make the effort to show that they have um, to make the effort to secure three quotes uh, where where they possibly can. It won't always be absolutely possible, but we want a genuine effort to 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 try. Mm -hmm. if possible, please, um, Alan. We got a just say is we'll take the remaining questions that we've not been able to answer we will try when we email people the recording we will try and answer the unanswered questions as best we can um, in writing and send that with you with the email uh, so it's a question from merrick uh, in the long term would it not be sensible for aonbs and uh, national parks to become the elm convener for the protected landscapes to secure a oh. collaborative agreement uh, so this was a Tom to answer. So yeah, to secure, a long uh, yeah Tom does it. Yeah. The best the essence of it. Should we become the conveners of L? Thank you, Chris. It, it's one of the, uh, it's, it's around one of the recommendations within the Glover Review, which uh, DEFRA will be consulting on shortly, um, the, the government response to the Glover Review. Uh, from the protected landscapes side, uh, that's absolutely a role that we would like to embrace um, um, for ELM. Um, and uh, we hope through farming and protected landscapes, we can also evidence a role to have a, a bespoke and um, personalised approach to uh, investment through ELM in the protected landscapes themselves. I agree with that. Um, we are close to our deadline of one o'clock. We'll have a couple of questions. Uh, it's a quick uh, logistics one. Um, if the AOMB doesn't have a lead person appointed and in place now, will the three-year window be extended for the uh, programme? Um, I can answer that, but I shall ask one of my colleagues to do so. Um, Sue, perhaps? They can give that question the bad news. No. So the programme will run <laughs> from, from, I think it actually officially launched, was it June? June, it was in June. 2021 it will end in 30 on the 31st of march 2024 however 
there, there are discussions with DEFRA um, around whether some of the funding may be able to move from year one into years two and three. So possibly it's best if, if Will uh, looks at perhaps adding to that. Uh, yep, yeah, that's right. Um, so yes, although we have started late, it, it shouldn't impact um, you applying for a project. I think um, there should be people within each protected landscape that will be able to help you. So um, yeah, do, do, I do encourage you to apply still. It's quite a challenge for AMB teams and we are trying up because we are you know, not as well resourced as national park teams, even though you know, they could do with more resources too. We are trying to manage the um, throughput of applications as best we can until we have FIPL, bespoke FIPL staff in place. And uh, you should, I hope, still get a, a very prompt and uh, professional service from your overstretched local AOMB team until they can actually you know, get a couple of people in post. That is starting to happen now. Many of the teams have got someone in post. And if you make an inquiry, I know you'll get a prompt response. Chris, it may just be worth adding on that is that, that, that it is an issue for protected landscapes in terms of how long for year one we've got for people to develop their ideas, their projects, uh, get the application in, for it to be approved, for it to be completed and for it to be claimed by the end of the financial year, end of March 2022. So, so it'd be really great what we're in terms of the talking to or thinking about the projects. If you do look at that phasing in terms of what is realistically deliverable this financial year uh, by all means put what your whole sort of ambition is in your application but in terms of concentrating on what can be delivered this this year i think that would be really really beneficial so thanks it would indeed uh alan last one and then we'll close uh last question i'm just talking through in terms of others to answer in a short time we've got um a quick question on the um on the actual application window um and again i think we've answered it already but it's um yeah, the application window would be running this year to 31st of January 2022. What I would say is that we will, in the Protected Landscapes teams, will be continuing to work with people through when that window has, has closed for this year, throughout um, February and March. We are likely to have panel meetings so that applications can be ready, uh, successful applications can be ready to go at the start of the new financial year. So we won't be um, stopping engaging with farmers and land managers holding our panel meetings, doing the assessment and supporting you to deliver exciting schemes through this programme. So uh, we'll now draw the session to a close. Um, I think the key thing to take away is that your next step with the programme is to contact your local AOMB and National Park team. Um, about today, we have a feedback form that uh, Anna will pop up on your, that should pop up on your screen, I think, uh, when you leave the webinar. Do please fill that in if you've got a moment. I'm sure it's not onerous. We'll be emailing the recording to you and any questions and um, that we hopefully that we haven't answered, we'll be able to answer those. So I'd like to thank our speakers and Anna Trance at the National Association for AOMBs for bringing this all together. And thank you to you for taking time out of your busy day. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>